Well, good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. Would you stand and join us as we sing together? Psalm 145. Here we go. I bless. I bless your name, O oh God. You say that I away from dawn to setting sun. Your greatness I'll proclaim. Your glory far exceeds all human thought. So with each breath I'll bless your name, O oh God. Your name will be revered, and children yet to come. As generations sing, wonders you have done. Strong and mighty deeds are always near. O oh God, most high, your name will be revered. How great is the Lord, worthy to be praised. How great is the Lord. and the weak. When we call out to you, you hear our cries, and all our needs your gracious hand provide. How great, how great is the Lord, greatly to be praised.
not fear. I do not fear the final night, for death will be the door to life. You take my hand and lead me through for all my ways I know to do. Oh, a peace and oh. Cornerstone greeting.
Um, it's going to be a six-week study starting June 14th through, through July 26th. And the topic will be the practice of prayer. And so Angela Sweet is the contact for that. But if you're interested, you can talk to either Angela Sweet or you can go to the website where in the news there's a link to register for that Bible study before it kicks off. So be on the lookout for that. So here at Cornerstone, we definitely have a heart for missions. really wanted to share the good news of the gospel, um, both here locally as well as across the globe. And we have a very unique opportunity, which we, we, we planned on doing previously, but it got rained out. But that's with a local ministry here in Southwest Houston called um, it's out with, with the Eyes on Me Ministries, but the event's Hip Hop Hope. And it's basically a time, and it, they're, we're looking for, for people to sign up and to, to come help serve food, to play games, um, and just to really share and pray with people. Uh, so it's really an opportunity to, to be the hands and feet here in Houston uh, for the gospel. So if you're interested in that, there's a way you can get involved on the e news. Look for a link there. Um, so there's a, that's a great opportunity. And then lastly, VBS is coming. So Vacation Bible Schools, it's time for the kids to sign up um, to be part of the theme this year is Keepers of the Kingdom. So it's really focused on how can we equip the kids kind of battle for truth. Um, and so that's the theme this year. But it's going to be June 27th through the 30th. So sign up for that um, online on the website. And, and then that also gives, gives the parents a little break during the week while the kids uh, do that. So, uh, and so that's all the announcements I have today. I want to shift to talk about ministry highlights. So what we've been doing is for the past number of months, every month we've been highlighting a ministry here at Cornerstone just to focus on it so that we can share what's going on, how can you can get involved. And so the, for the month of June, we're going to be highlighting uh, the care ministry. And so the care ministry is, so I was talking to JK, I didn't realize this was, she wanted to kind of figure out how can we, how can we summarize what the care ministry is and kind of outline an acronym. If you go to the next slide, there we go. So comforting and remembering everyone. And this is really the heart of this ministry, is how can we be the hands and feet of the body of Christ to, to, to the people that are in this church? So really the mission is to, to love and support our church, to, our church body, and to really come alongside our home teams. We have home teams, which are our community groups, and often that's our first kind of line in, in addressing needs of people. But sometimes people aren't in home teams, or sometimes the needs are so great, so that kind of that goes to the, to the care ministry. So the care ministry is, is a great way, and what they often do is you might be bringing meals to people, writing notes. Um, you can go to the next slide. It shows some pictures. So this is uh, making blankets. So some of these are handmade blankets for people that are having um, new babies. Um, and there might also be bringing flowers. Next slide. Just show bringing flowers for, for a time to be. So there's just a lot of ways to really show people that you know we're thinking about you and you're not alone um, in this. And so if that sounds like something you'd like to be involved with, Something that it's a way that you'd like to serve. Reach out to JK. JK is right here in the back, waiting to go. And uh, I'd love, love for, to get you connected with that ministry. And over the next couple weeks, we'll be hearing a little bit more about the ministry and ways you can get involved. So, with that, let's transition to the time of prayer. I'm going to read a uh, piece of scripture that we're going to pray. So, this is 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 13. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of Israel. God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise for your glories. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you for all that you've done. God, and all the things that you've promised that you will do, that we know will be. God, we thank you that you love us so tremendously. God, that while we were dead in our sins, that means that your, your son, Jesus, to live a perfect life, to die, to be raised from the dead, God, so that we may know you, that we may have a relationship with you. Not about anything that we've done, but God, God, because of your grace and your love. God, we, we pray that we can live lives that reflect that truth, God, the gravity of the gospel, the sacrifice that you've made. God, I pray that you just teach each of us how we can live day in, day out, just the ways that is, that is God honoring. God, we just lift up, we pray for VBS as it's coming up, for the, for the student, for the kids. I pray for the community. 
as this opportunity for, for children of the community to come to hear the gospel, to hear the good news. And God, to just be an opportunity to start their relationship with you. God, we're excited to hear that. God, we pray for the for Tristan, children's ministry. And I just pray that, that they, they help them in preparations for that. And I just pray maybe a sweet time, God, that is, that is glorifying to you. And also our students, I pray for our students as they enter the summer season. God, be with them, give them wisdom. Maybe a time that they spend their time, God, in ways that are God honoring as well. God, we thank you for your, your grace. And God, we pray that you teach us how to love, how to care for others, Lord. And teach us how to love graciously. God, regardless of how we're treated, <laughs> God, we thank you. God, for your goodness, for grace, your holy name.
My future is heaven And I praise God For what He's done Sing for the freedom He has won Even death is dead and done His life has overcome Speak, say the name above all names Over every broken place He is risen from the grave What He's done, what He's done What He's done All the glory and the honor to the Son are forgiven my future is heaven and I praise God for what he's done and now on the throne of majesty the fathers will come be he reigns in victory Hallelujah to the King, He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. What He's done, what He's done, what He's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven. My future is heaven, and I praise God for what He's done. What He's done, one last time. What He's done, what He's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. I praise God for what He's done. And we are here to praise you this morning, Lord, for the things that you've done. We're so grateful for this time to be able to be together, to worship you, to hear from you. Would you speak now to our hearts may we hear from your word powerful this morning lord we're thankful for all these things we pray in the precious name of jesus amen and it's my joy to welcome to the pulpit this morning one of our elders mr eric fridge good morning everyone so very good to see you for me it's always uh, it's an honor to get to stand before you as we open up god's word together i want to begin our time together and just share a couple uh, thoughts with you um, one, I want to begin by just saying thank you. Um, yesterday, we had a group of folks that were here, and we had kind of a campus work day, work project. In fact, we've got some pictures of all the folks that came out and did a lot of different projects around the, around the campus. In case you didn't know, um, I mean, God has blessed us with just a beautiful piece of property here, over 20 acres, and um, so many of you have... Um, put so much sweat equity into this property to make it look like it does. In case you didn't know, all of our property is done and taken care of throughout the year by a, a group of volunteers, uh, our grounds crew ministry, and they do such a fantastic job, and that's such a blessing to this church, because if we were to contract that out uh, and have a professional landscape crew, it would be upwards of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year that we would spend on that. Instead, um, our volunteers give of their time and their energy to take care of this place, and then that way that money can go back into um, to ministry and, and the work of this church. And so um, I just want to say thank you to all those folks, and can you help me encourage them just in um, what they do for this church? And if you didn't notice on the way in how good the campus looked, looks make sure on your way out just notice it's beautiful to come out here and just see all the wildlife and uh, everything it's really a great 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 place and the second thing I want to do is give you an invitation um, uh, you might not know this but uh, during this hour 
uh, we actually have an adult Bible fellowship. It's basically Bible class for adults. And maybe you're at that stage and you're thinking, boy, I'd really like to know more about my Bible and I'd like to get in and study a little bit more. Well, we have that going on at this time while the kids are in their classes right upstairs. It's on the other side of this wall. And um, it's our adult Bible fellowship. And this summer, just today, we're starting off a new series. It's called Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives. And I know that summertime, a lot of people are traveling kind of in and out. And so we wanted to do something different in that class. And that is each week's lesson stands alone. And so if you miss a couple weeks because you're traveling, whatever, not a big deal. You can kind of come in and out of that class. And what we're doing is the first half of the summer, we're taking a look at um, Jesus' apostles. And some of you might be thinking, well, I know the apostles, right? There's, there's Peter and John and you, you know the apostles, you know the song. And, but, you know, there's a lot more detail that you might not know about the apostles. I mean, how much do you know about Andrew? How much do you know about Nathaniel? Did you know that there were two Judases among that group? Do you know what kind of car the apostles drove? Well, do you? I mean, Acts chapter 2, it says it right there in Pentecost. The apostles were in one accord. And so, um, we got lots of bad jokes like that that happen in ABF, so come back and join us. The second half of the summer, we're actually doing a study on um, some extraordinary women of the Bible. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at some of those stories, Old Testament and New Testament. Just want to invite you to join us uh, for ABF. Sometimes it's, it's great fellowship. That group um, prays together. We get to know each other. We open up our Bibles and let God's Word speak to us. And there's always great discussion. So if you're looking for uh, a place to maybe take your Bible study to the next level, it's a great place to go. So that's that. So let's begin our time together this morning. Um, with uh, just opening up in prayer. Father God, we are grateful that you brought us together today as brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, this morning it's my prayer that we would do a better job of loving the people around us, that we would look past imperfections, annoyances, and even when people treat us poorly. Father, we would ask that you would help us to love like you do. Jesus, thank you for being that example for us. We pray that we would learn to be more like you each and every day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed how your day can be ruined uh, just by the way someone treats you? I mean, if you're out there and you're, you're driving your car and somebody cuts you off or, or maybe somebody doesn't say hello or, or, or maybe they don't even, you know, smile at you when, when they pass by. And, and I mean, that can be just in the church parking lot. I mean, we oftentimes, just the way we're wired, we often treat people the way they have treated us. That's just kind of our nature. But... It's important to understand that we reflect back communication as well as personality in how somebody interacts with us. In other words, if somebody smiles at you or has a kind word for you, you tend to do the same thing back to them. But if somebody maybe doesn't look at you or they're unfriendly or maybe they even speak harshly to you, we tend to, to bristle back at them. That's called reflective communication and we do that throughout our day because it's our basic nature to treat others the way that we have been treated and Jesus knew that and that's why he says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 46 he says if you love those who love you what reward do you have do not even the tax collectors do the same and if you greet only brothers what more uh, what more are you doing than others don't even the Gentiles do the same? You see, that's how we operate. When we're nice to somebody, they're typically nice back to us. If our circumstances are good, our attitude is usually better. But there is a problem with that, and you might not notice, but not everybody's always nice, and things don't always go our way. In fact, it's our very nature most of us are pretty selfish and very often we treat one another poorly 
We do that at school. We do that at work. Sometimes we even do that in our own homes. So here's the question that I have for us this morning. How can we reflect an attitude of Jesus Christ even when others treat us poorly? How is it that we can reflect back an attitude of Jesus when somebody is mean or nasty to us? Is that possible? So this morning we're going to take a look at um, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 18. You can go ahead and open up your Bibles there. That's where we'll spend most of our time. But before we get into that text, what I want to do is I want to put this section of Scripture in context to the letter of what's going on. And I want to remind you, um, just kind of remember back to last week's lesson as Daniel brought to us. He reminded us that as Christians, we're to live our lives in such a way to show unbelievers who Jesus is. In fact, in verse 12, Peter reminds us, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Gentiles were unbelievers. So in other words, Peter is saying to us, he's saying, we live in a world of unbelieving people, and therefore it's our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ for our actions, our attitude, and our relationships to reflect Jesus Christ. That's important to remember because for each of us, we live in a world that is filled with people that don't know Jesus. And they're watching all the time. They're watching the things we do, the way we speak, the way we treat one another because it all reflects back who Jesus is if we say we are Christians. Now, in this section of Scripture, there's, it's really divided into three different topics. The first topic is our social response to an unbelieving world. And Daniel covered this last week in, in his lesson, the first part of uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, in our response to the government. And he talked about why it is that we should be good citizens. Why is it that we follow and obey the laws? And that's because that's a reflection on who Jesus is as believers. This week, we're going to talk about our responsibility um, in the workplace. Now, in this section of Scripture, uh, Peter actually addresses the relationships between slaves and masters. And now, of course, we know this is kind of a stick, sticky topic, and so we're going to unpack all of that here in just a couple of moments. But then the third topic is what Daniel is going to cover next week, and that's how we live out our faith at home. In other words, what is our responsibility as husbands and wives? And so we're going to let Daniel take that next week. Um, so if you would, open up your Bibles. We're going to start in verse 18. Here's what it says. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, you might not realize this, but next to your home, your job is where you spend most of your time. In fact, half of our waking hours are spent on the job. And because we spend so much time on the job, our workplace becomes an opportunity for each of us to make an impact on our coworkers. Which is why Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, he says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father, to your Father who is in heaven. You see, each one of us, we've got an opportunity to share who Jesus is through our work. Whether you work at an office, whether you work out of your car, whether you're working remotely, the way you do your job is, and the way you treat others is a reflection on who Jesus is. Now, early in the week, uh, I sat down with one of our church members, Sharon Johnson. Uh, a lot of you all know Sharon. She's been around here for a long time. She's a very talented and gifted lady. She works in hospital administration, and she has a challenging job. And over the years, she's really held 
a lot of different jobs within the hospital system. She's been on that low-level employee, and, and she's also worked her way to a management position to where she has a lot of people that work for her. So I sat down with her and asked her some questions about her job and how is it that she lives out her faith there in the hospital. And so uh, I did a little video just to show you that, uh, that conversation. What I love about my job is I have the opportunity to impact people. Um, first of all, I'm in healthcare, so obviously people are coming to your location when they've got some of the biggest needs and some of the biggest fears in their lives, and you can be there, and you can be a hand to hold and tell them that they're going to get good care. The other thing is I love watching people grow. So I've loved watching people who thought they had no career, who didn't have lots of money, who didn't have great opportunities, learn to have a career and to be able to work and to be able to work hard and work up in an organization and be able to care for their family in a way that worked for them. I think the most challenging thing at work is to remain humble. I mean, to really understand that God's got me there for His purpose, not my own, and that I'm there as a servant to lead people or to be led and to submit. But to keep that humility is not always easy, especially when you have a lot of responsibility. I think the most difficult thing working with people is that not everybody comes to work to do their best job. I believe most people do, but when things don't go well or when people make choices that are not good, the hardest thing is to actually separate somebody from an organization. Well, at work as a manager or as a leader, I always for, I want people to know that I believe in Jesus because I want them to hold me to a higher standard. I want them to hold me accountable and I want them to come to me if they need something. So for me, a lot of times personally, if people are having trouble, I don't mind stopping and saying, I'm praying for you. How are things going? Follow up with them, follow up with their family. And I certainly want to be at their funerals, their weddings, their big events because it matters to people. So I want to show up for them. One of the things about being an ambassador for Christ at work or at any place is to love people. And I would tell you, First Peter 4, 8, love deeply for it covers a multitude of sins. I do use that a lot and think, you know what, I don't always like the situation or I don't always like what's going on, but I can love these people. I love how she expresses her faith within, within the workplace because she realizes that she has an opportunity um, not only to um, honor God through her work, but uses her platform to touch the people in her life um, for Jesus Christ. And that's a great calling. And as we look at this section of Scripture where, where Peter is really addressing this relationship between uh, slaves and masters, which most of us cannot understand or really relate to that topic, I think we can relate to, to this idea uh, of how we live out our faith within the workplace because more than likely all of us have been in different challenging situations throughout our career or maybe at a job that you've had. Maybe you've had a boss that was difficult. Maybe you had coworkers that were hard to, to be around. Maybe you had an assignment at some point that you just weren't crazy about but yet you realize that God puts you in that situation for a reason. So let's take a look back at this section of scripture uh, and, and starting with verse 18. It, it says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Now, that word servant that is used here in uh, uh, Peter 18, uh, 2, 18 is translated from the word oiketai, which is not a common word that's often used for slave in the New Testament. In fact, if you've done any study on this, the word that you most often uh, bump up to in the New Testament is the word doulos. But this word oiketai is just a little bit different because it's describing somebody that was a slave, but they were a domestic or a household helper. Still a slave, but a little bit different because this type of servant would have lived in a home with the master, and they would have often worked closely together. Most of these types of servants would have been educated and even well-trained to manage a household. We see a number of examples of these types of folks throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, a servant could be anything from a doctor to an accountant or even a kitchen helper. But 
Um, as we've talked about before uh, during our teaching time, in fact, earlier in the year when we were looking at Paul's letter to Philemon, we talked about this topic of slavery. And just to remind you that at this point in time when this letter is written, in the Roman Empire there was estimated to be about 60 million slaves or servants, which was roughly about half of the population of Rome at that time. So it shouldn't be shocking to us that Peter addresses not only in this letter as he's talking to Christians and how to live their life, not only is he talking to men and women, but he's also talking to those who are slaves and those who are free. You see, slavery was just a, a part of their culture. It was part of their fabric. It, it had been around for thousands of years, and we know slavery still exists today. Now, I know you already know this, but I want to say it just to make sure we're all on the same page and be very, very clear. Slavery is wrong. In fact, it goes against the very grain of the message of the New Testament. Because the story of redemption that's communicated throughout the Bible, redemption is the setting of someone free by paying a price for them. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and I on the cross. He redeemed our lives. That is the story of the Bible. So when we're looking at these relationships that Peter is talking about here, this relationship between a slave and a master, we need to be fair when we're looking at it in context of history because there were slaves or there were masters that loved their slaves. In fact, we know through history that there were slaves um, that were considered almost part of the family in the households that they worked. But we also know that there were masters that were very cruel, that were very harsh, that would beat their slaves when they did something wrong or for no reason at all. Why? Because at this time there was this culture. Slaves were viewed as non, a non-person. They were viewed as a piece of property. And so there was this mindset that you could do anything because slaves had no rights. And I share this information to you, not just so we'll understand the time and the culture or use it as an excuse, but to really more importantly, to understand the weight of the message of what Peter is really saying here. Because he's got to communicate, he's, he's trying to communicate to us um, how we should act when someone treats us poorly. So, what does Peter have to say about this group of believers who were also slaves? Back to verse 18, he says, Servants, be subject, or some of your translations will say submissive, to your masters with all respect. Now, that word subject or submissive um, is a difficult word for a lot of folks. But when you really look at the origins of what they're trying to say there, the word actually is translated from a military word that is um, uh, basically translated place under an order place under in an orderly fashion. In other words, knowing who's in charge and who's responsible for what. That is the actual translation of this word, subject or submission. And so Peter gives us instructions here on how we're to work when we're under someone else's authority, even somebody who is cruel. And now many people are surprised at what he says here because he says you should use your position or your place, even as a slave, to serve in such a way that those around you notice that there's something different about you. That you are also a servant of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the things that I love uh, about these New Testament letters because they really give us some unique insight to the culture and the mindset of these early believers. Because when you think about this letter from Peter, but you also think about the letter of Paul, you know, as Paul was writing to the different churches, you know, uh, to the Philemons or Galatians, all of those letters he's writing, and he's writing from where? From prison, right? I mean, if you or I were in prison, what do you think we would be writing about? I mean, I think I'd be writing, boy, the food here is terrible, and the guards are mean to me, and I sure miss my cable TV or whatever it is. And um, my letters probably would look very different. But Paul, as he writes, he takes a very different approach. 
Because Paul sees his position, wherever God places him, he is going to be a servant, and he is going to talk about Jesus. He, he talks about uh, Jesus to any of the visitors that come see him. He talks to, uh, about Jesus to all the other inmates. And, and we know from his writings that he also is talking to the palace guard about who Jesus is. And, and so Paul, whatever position he is in, he's always talking about Jesus. And that's the same thing that Peter is telling us here as well. He's saying, hey, even if you're in this position as a slave, guess what? You need to use your opportunity, even as a slave, even if you're mistreated, as an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. So, here's the first principle that I want to share with you this morning from this text. I believe, as Christians, no matter what our situation, whatever our place is in our career or in work, is to show up and to work hard. Be the kind of employee that an, employ, an employer would want to hire and keep around. Don't be the kind of employee that shows up late or always has a negative attitude or complains about everything that's on the job. Instead, do simple things. Show up on time. Don't leave early. Don't cut corners. Don't steal time, energy, or resources from your company. Why? Because you are a representative of Jesus Christ and you don't want to reflect poorly on our Lord and Savior. And just as Peter continues, he, he goes on to say, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. In other words, Peter's saying here, just because your boss is a jerk, don't be a bitter employee. Continue to treat your boss with respect, even if they are unfair to you. And that's the difference of showing up and working hard. Because you'll become the kind of employee that companies are desperate for. And at the same time, you'll maybe have the opportunity to change some hearts and some minds of the folks around you. Maybe your supervisor, maybe your boss, maybe your coworkers. Look at the next section of this text, verse 19. He says, For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Basically, he's saying, hey, if you're a servant out there and you're working hard, but your um, master is still beating you, he's got, some, he's got some encouragement for us. Verse 20, he says, uh, For what credit is it if when you sin, you are beaten for it, and you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. You see, Peter reminds us here that there are some terrible bosses that are out there. But sometimes we tend to blame, uh, blame others for our own mistakes or our bad decisions that put us in a bad place. I don't know if you're like me, but... There are times in my life that I have made some on-the-job mistakes. And when I have made those mistakes or maybe done something that wasn't right, and I know I'm going to get maybe in trouble for it or, or I'm going to get reprimanded from my supervisor, before I ever get to that conversation, you know what I start doing? I start looking for excuses. Have you ever done that? You start looking for excuses of why you did something wrong. Or, or maybe you even start putting that onto your coworkers. Well, I'm not the only one that did this, or I'm not the only one that's ever cut corners, or I'm not the only one that didn't get my work on time. You know, if so-and-so would have shown up on time, or if my boss would have been more encouraging to me. And we come up with all of these ideas of why, why we're in trouble. But instead, Peter reminds us here, he says, when you've made a mistake and you know you're going to get caught, um, don't blame that on someone else. Instead, realize um, this in verse 20. But he also says here, um, in these situations where you've been treated poorly, that we shouldn't react like non-believers do. Instead, we should continue to show respect. We should, should continue to show grace and to show mercy. Even when someone is mistreating you, he says, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Which leads me to my second principle, and that is, 
life has both good and bad. As believers, we should advertise both. You see, because you're going to have bosses that um, are not good bosses. We'll all have assignments that we don't necessarily enjoy. But at least you have a job. I mean, you never appreciate your job more than suddenly when you find yourself out of a job or without a paycheck. And when you find yourself in a difficult situation, I want to ask you to do a couple of things. Maybe you've got a difficult boss. Maybe you've stuck, been stuck with an assignment that's miserable. Maybe you have co-workers, co-workers that are difficult. Regardless of the circumstance, be consistent. When things aren't going well, or things are going well, give God the credit for your ability that He's given you. And when things are challenging, make sure the folks around you know that you're only able to continue because of God's help. Make sure that you advertise God's faithfulness through both situations. Now, when I began, I asked you to think about a question. How is it that I can reflect, uh, or how is it that I can reflect an attitude of Jesus even when others treat me poorly? Peter not only gives us an answer here, he also calls us to live a life that, that follows the example of Jesus Christ. Look at how he finishes out uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 21. He says this, uh, For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sin in his body on a tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like a sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. A lot of people ask that question. Why am I in this situation? Why am I suffering? Why do things not seem to go right for me? Why am I being mistreated? And how through all of this can I put on a brave face? How can I put on a smile? How can I show the love of Jesus when all of these things are happening? Peter reminds us that we are not the only ones who suffer. Instead, he points us to the cross. He says, look at Jesus. When they beat him, when they tortured him, when they screamed at him, when they spit on him, when they said terrible things about him, he did not react in a way that many of us would. He didn't react in a way where he was fighting back, but instead he reacted in a way where he continued to forgive, he continued to love. Uh, So when you're in a situation where you feel like you're suffering, know that we serve a God that understands We serve a God that understands difficult situations and hard times. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer and to be mistreated. And he asks us to follow in those same footsteps. And you think, wow, why is that? Why would we do that? Why why would we ask for that kind of suffering? Paul gives us that answer, Romans chapter 5. He says, suffering produces Perseverance, perseverance, uh, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our lives through the Holy Spirit which He's given us. And so if you're wondering how is it that you can do that, how is it that you can reflect an attitude of Jesus Christ 
even when you're being mistreated, you can't do it on your own. It takes that help from God's Holy Spirit that's living within you and within me. You know, right now, as we're thinking about how we're supposed to follow in Jesus' footsteps, as a church family, we're going to enter into a time of, of communion. And so I want to ask you, just to, as we enter into this time of communion, to think back uh, about what Christ has done for each of us. In fact, right now, our ushers are going to pass out the emblems. Uh, communion is a time where we remember the sacrifice that was made for each one of us. As we remember the body and the blood that was broken and shed for our mistakes. So, as uh, the emblems are being passed out, I want to ask that you think about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know for many of you, you're thinking, I need to do better. I hope this remembrance is a reminder to each of us that our sins are forgiven. That his body was broken, his blood was shed to wash over all of our mistakes so that we can have a relationship with him. Let's think about that for just a moment before we take the, the bread and the cup together. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 says for what I receive I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures this morning as a church family we have an opportunity to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the body that was broken and the blood that was shed for our sins. Let's remember that this morning and let's pray first. Dear Father God, we thank, we're thankful for the precious gift of Jesus. That although we make so many mistakes, you don't see those mistakes. Instead, you see the blood that washes over and forgives us and makes us whole. Father, thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you for that kind of love. We remember that today. Thank you, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. The body and the blood. Peter reminds us that throughout life, 
we're all going to uh, have some difficult situations. But if we will keep in front of us that example and follow the example of Jesus Christ that even though we are mistreated, even though sometimes we are rejected, we can still love those around us. That's what changes hearts and lives. And that's what we strive to do as a church family. And so this morning, if you're with us, and maybe today you're, you're carrying a heavy burden that you don't think you can carry on your own anymore, we want to be there for you. And today we've got a number of our elders and our, our pastors that are here. We'd love to just spend a little time with you, maybe pray with you, talk with you. Maybe today you're ready to, to grow in your relationship with God. Maybe you're ready to take that next step and, and put Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. We'd love to, to walk that journey with you as well. So as we end our time together, I want to ask that you go ahead and stand. And we're going to pray and we're going to sing one last song. But if there's anything we can do for you today, we want to be here for you. So let's bow together and let's pray. Father God, we bow before you this morning. And uh, we specifically pray for individuals today that are suffering with different difficult situations. Knowing us, knowing that there are some of us that are struggling with relational challenges, others that are feeling beaten down from a heavy load of the jobs that we do, and others that are just struggling in silence with personal addictions. Father, I I know that um, at times I have felt like a slave to sin, but Father, we know that it is through your redemption that we can find freedom Help us to know what that freedom is like. We want to feel the power of your love and the grace that flows through our lives so that we can go out and share that and love the people that are around us. Jesus, thank you for being that example for us. And we pray that we would learn to live more like you each and every day. Amen. Blessed be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again To a living hope Through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead To a living hope Through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead To an inheritance imperishable Undefiled, unfading Kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven for you. To an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power. Are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to a living hope through the resurrection of
Cornerstone. We'll look forward to seeing you all next Sunday. You're dismissed. Have a great day.